still going to go forth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to ask everybody to continue to pray for my dad um, and continue to pray for um, Darlene's dad. Uh, they're going through a very rough time right now. Um, you know, they, the doctors are saying that my dad has some kind of stuff. I'm not going to say it, but, but we know I'm not going to speak those things into his life. You know, I believe that the Lord's doing a work in him and, and the Lord's going to heal him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. One thing that my dad doesn't understand is that he's going to share his testimony at the men's conference now in September of how the Lord has touched him and how the Lord has healed him from whatever the doctors are saying right now. But we serve the physician of physicians. Amen. Amen. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. I love this scripture, this chapter, um, especially in verse 19, because it talks about the anchor. What are we anchored to? You know, when you think of an anchor, the shape of an anchor, if you really look at an anchor, there's still a cross shaped inside of the anchor. Yeah. And anchors are used for, for, for you know, the, the people that ride boats and that go fishing, the fishermen and stuff, they use anchors to put it down for the anchor can go all the way down for that way they're their ships don't move, their boats don't move. And that's the way the anchor should be when we're anchored in Christ, is that we need to be unmovable yes. in our faith, unshakable in our faith, no matter what, what is coming towards us. And tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about, about God's Word because it's an unmovable anchor in times of a storm. You know, Last season, we went through some stuff and it was preparing us to get us through this season that we're going through now. You know, sometimes you, you stop and think, you're like, man, when's it going to let up on us, right? Like, when's this going to end? It's like, can we just have a little bit of peace, a little bit of, of just some time where our hearts ain't racing, where our minds ain't spinning? Can we just have a little bit of time of of just like, but in times like that, we don't grow. So there has, something has to be taking place in our life so that we can understand the need we have for God. So in Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 19, and we're going to read 19 and 20, the word of the Lord says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. See, the safety of sailors depended greatly on a ship's anchor. Without it, the likelihood of shipwreck in, increased dramatically when they didn't have that anchor on, on their ship. The anchor therefore became an important emblem of hope and stability for the early Christians. See, Christ is our anchor. That's our hope. Christ should be the only thing that we are hanging on to. You know, when, when, when you're going through storms, when you're going through uh, a season in your life where you don't know if you're coming or you don't know if you're going and and I mean, we've all been through those seasons, right? And it seems like, like you just end one season and then another one starts. It's like the summer doesn't stop before it becomes winter. It's like you go from one season to another season. So, some seasons are not as rough as others, as we can tell in the four seasons that we have. Summer is not as rough as winter, okay? 
But what happens during the winter time is that we learn how to manage in the cold. We learn how to manage in, in cold weather, how to drive in snow, how to drive on the freeways, how to, you know, because over here once it starts snowing, forget it. It's like everybody gets crazy, you know. They either go too fast or they brake too hard and they end up causing an accident. See, the Christian's hope is in the person and saving work of Christ. This hope is an anchor providing security and stability for the soul. See, if God ignites a storm in your life, He has definite purpose in mind for it. Even if the difficulties you face don't come from Him, He takes advantage of them and makes them profitable. See, sometimes we go through things, and another one is, is Pastor Jude's father going through similar things as my father. But these are storms in life, and how can we face the storms in life without our anchor? We need to be anchored in Christ. See, because the anchor, we, we lay down the foundation, we lay down the anchor, and whatever storm hits us, we're not going to be moved. Just like the ship. When a fisherman is, is right in this place, is in this area where they want to be for a while, they put down the anchor for the boat doesn't move because they know that the waters kind of shift sometimes. You know, I remember one year, me, my mom, and my brother, well, the whole family, we were out at Alfin Butte, and we were on the boat. And when we left, sure, we were out playing around. I mean, there was not one cloud in the sky. Not one cloud in the sky. And we went out, and we are riding around in the boat and stuff. And we went pretty far, but not like, like far, far, like it took us like hours to get there. <laughs> <laughs> but we want you guys to understand now. Yes. We're on the same page, okay? Just yeah. checking, okay? <laughs> While a storm hit, right of a sudden, and we were new and in, in, in riding boats and stuff, and the water literally started coming inside of the boat. And I was freaking out. It was like shifting, and my mom was freaking out. It was me, my brother, and my mom on the boat. You remember, right? And man, we thought we were going to die, like seriously. And we're like an elephant dude, I mean like, we're not in the middle of the ocean, I mean we can see like the shore and, and stuff, but just to get there, it was horrendous. There was big old waves on the, on the water, waves, 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 and it was just moving the boat all over, moving the boat all over. But see, that's where the anchor comes in. When the anchor comes in, is that we put down the anchor, which is Christ, and now those storms can't move us. See, because the enemy, just as God can take advantage of the storms for His glory, the enemy can try to defeat you through those storms as well. Yes. If we're not anchored in Christ. So Christ has to be our anchor. You know, <clears throat> a couple of years ago for our men's conference, my dad made me a cross, a cross that to, uh, to give away for the men's conference, and it was an anchor. It was a cross laying down and an anchor on the cross, and it was so beautiful, and I wish he would have made a replica because I would have liked to have won it, but if I would have won it, they would have thought it was fixed, and you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so my wife didn't let me get a ticket. <laughs> So Romans 15, 4, the word of the Lord says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that, that through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. See, a storm can either destroy you or develop you. It's up to you. If you are truly submitted to God, He will use the storms you encounter in life to build your strength, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, commitment, devotion, faith, and serenity, peace, and joy. Can we have peace through the storm? Absolutely. 
Sometimes do we, do we allow fear to settle in during a storm? Absolutely. It's because our anger is, we're not anchored down the way we're supposed to be anchored down. And sometimes the enemy will try to bombard us with fear and worry. And we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what, what's going to And then we have all these thoughts from all the doctors, from all these people telling us all this negative stuff. Well, this is, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. So we start preparing our minds and our minds going crazy. But that's not what the Word of God says. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Only He can determine when we're born and when we die. Mm -hmm. You know, years ago, and I told this story several times, but years ago, I mean years ago, a friend of mine called me, a good friend of mine called me because his mom was the doctor, you know, I was, me and my brother were part of the family, kind of, you know, we grew up together. And he called me and he says, hey bro, he says, you think you and your wife can come and, and pray with my mom? She's here at the hospital and the doctor's going to come in at 7 o'clock in the evening and he's going to talk to us and stuff like this. We'd like for you guys to be here. So I call my wife up. We show up that evening and pray with her. The most beautiful Christian woman. She just, she did not hate nobody. This woman, she just loved everybody. She didn't dislike anything. I never seen not one part of hatred in her life. Those, those, you know, Southern Baptist women that just such hospitality, right? And us growing up, man, we used to, all the stuff that we used to get into and stuff like this, she would still like welcome us and, and she wouldn't tell her son not to hang out with us and stuff like that, right? But he called me because the doctor needed to speak with the family. The doctor went in that, that, uh, that morning, that evening, and he said, ma'am, he said, you're going to die. So there's nothing else I can do for you. So he told the family, he said, you guys need to go up to the 10th floor and, and get everything prepared for hospice, and you're going to have her in hospice, you know. So what do, I mean, naturally, we freak out. We're like, what do you mean? Like, what's going on? But I kept telling my wife, I mean, she doesn't look like she's going to die to me. I mean, I've seen people die and I've seen people sick and she doesn't look, she doesn't fit in that category, you know? Well, the family started making preparations and they took her to the 10th floor. Well, when we had the hospice unit there at the hospital, if a patient doesn't die during a certain amount of time, they say, well, you, you know, you need, they don't tell the patient, well, you need to die, you know, within this time. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? They like say, so you're going to have to do home hospice. Okay? I think it was a couple of weeks, maybe, right? Uh -huh. So she went to home hospice. They got her a hospital bed. She was laying in the living room. And, and we'd go over there and visit with her and stuff. And I'm like, man. And she, they just told her, don't, we don't want you walking around and stuff because you can fall, get seizure, and hurt yourself. And, and I'm like thinking to myself, wow. So she listened. She listened. And she was just bedridden. She wouldn't really get up and stuff. And we went there one time, and my wife started opening up all the mini blinds and curtains and letting some light in there and, because it looked like so depressing, you know? Well, about a month and a half later, a doctor comes in and visits her and takes her from being in hospice to being in rehab. She went to that rehab for another, for about another month, month and a half. After rehab, she was still alive for seven years. She just passed away last year. Eight years. Eight years. She just passed away last year. See, God, only God knows. Only God can determine when we're going to die. Not the doctors, yes, I, you know what, their profession and stuff, but they just go on what everybody else does. But see, not everybody else is a follower of Christ. See, her faith and her belief, she's like, well, if you're going to take me, Lord, you can take me, you know, but I feel fine. Like, I mean, I mean, she was ready regardless 
But I just knew that there was nothing wrong. See, so sometimes we just have to get those things that come and people tell us the negative stuff and we need to discard it and throw it away. What does God say? What does the Word of God say? Jesus came to give us life and life in abundance. And only He can determine our expiration date. Not no doctor, not no science, not no psychologist. Nobody can determine your expiration date. Okay? But we have to understand that God can use your storm. He can use your disease, whatever it is that you're fighting, whatever it is that you're dealing with, to bring Himself glory. Because God, that's, that, that's what He loves to do. He loves to show everybody, He loves to show everybody how good and how powerful He is. That He can heal people to this day. Especially in the medical field. Because a lot of time, the medical people, they're the ones that are taking the credit for what God is doing. But the Lord knows how to show them up. Thank you, Jesus, for that. So no matter what is it that we're facing, no matter what trials we're going through, we have to know that Jesus Christ is our anchor. And we have to be anchored down on Him. We have to make Him our foundation, our solid foundation, no matter what the world throws at us. Psalms 119, 71 and 72, the word of the Lord says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Wow, that, that right there just blew me away. How could you say, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. So here he is, he's saying, man, because of who you are, And what's been happening to me and because of the affliction in my life I'm able to show who you are right. how many of us have been there well, yeah. yeah how many of us are going through there mm -hmm. see we should be thankful when God disciplines us for our sin painful as it may be it drives us back to his truth which is far more valuable than all the riches of this world God wants only what is best for us we have to understand that we would be wise to learn from God's discipline rather than fight it it is given for our betterment not our destruction God wants to help us he wants to build us up into the character that He created us to be. He wants us to be that man of God. And do I fall short? Absolutely. But see, just like David, David fell short, but he really turned his heart around to God and had a really true repentive heart and said, Lord, forgive me because I have sinned against you. Search my heart. He was asking God to search his heart to make sure that there was nothing unclean there and giving him permission to remove it if needed to be. In Psalms 18, verse 30 to 32, the word of the Lord says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. For who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. See, David praised God for protecting those who look to God for help. See, God will protect us if we are willing to admit our weaknesses and depend on Him. See, we have to admit that we're nothing without Him. I don't care how much school you have. I don't care how much theology you have. I don't care how many seminaries you've had. That does mean nothing. What means something to God is your heart. Is Where is your heart at? 
Because I've met some such intelligent people that, man, that like, I mean, if we were to have a debate, it would probably confuse me. But their heart is not in the right place. Their heart is all up here. Just what they know. I mean, knowledge is good. Like my mentor, my mentor had two master's degrees, two doctorate degrees. And he told me himself, he says, Son, all these degrees mean nothing if I don't use it to glorify God. Amen. He wasn't boasting on, he was boasting on God. What God has allowed him to do. How God has, was able to move him from this to this to this to this. But sometimes as believers, and it's happened to us, yes, we learn a few scriptures, we learn a couple stories, and then now we're, we're trying to make it seem like we're on top of the world. And we're making everybody seem beneath us. How can people learn? How can people look up to us? And we're trying to elevate ourselves above them. And it's happened. I've seen it. I've been in studies where I'm like, man, what am I even doing here? Like, really? But we know that God will always turn around wherever the Lord plants a man of God, He plants you there for a purpose. To bring change to His kingdom. To bring change that needs to be done. Because that's our God. He's a good God. It's really not about what you know. But it's about the condition of your heart. That's what God is more concerned about is your heart. What you know about God isn't going to get you to heaven. See, because the demons tremble at His name. They'll come and try to twist His word around and make you believe the lie of the devil. Make you believe the lie of the enemy. And they're very sneaky. They creep up when you least expect it. That's why it's awesome to have amazing wives. Because they've creeped up when I least expected it. And the Lord just tells my wife to talk to me because I'm not listening. But I'm like, I haven't heard you. See, He will give us the power to do what is right in difficult situations and give us the ability to walk without stumbling, even when the path is slippery. Because we have to depend on our anchor. Jesus Christ is our anchor. We have to be anchored down. What would happen if you're riding a horse and you stop somewhere and let the horses like really, really well trained and stuff. But you put the horse down and you just take off without anchoring the horse to the fence or to the barn or whatever. A lot of times that horse can take off. It can get spooked, it can run away, it can do all these things, right? See, we need to be anchored to the word, we need to be anchored to the cross, we need to be anchored to Jesus. And we have to be anchored to the man that is no longer on the cross. See, you know, I've had people leave the church because of the cross. Because we're idolizing it. No, we're not idolizing it. But it's a reminder every time that I come up here to die to my flesh, to die to myself, because the cross signifies death. But it also signifies life, because Jesus is not there no more. That's right. And when we fall short, when we deliberately 
sin against our God, it's like we're putting him back on the cross. See, the Bible is written record of God's unfolding revelation of himself, his ways, his character, and nature through the spoken word in history and ultimately through the coming of his son, Christ Jesus, into this world. So what did this world do when Jesus came? You know, you look, you look at his ministry, you look at everything that he'd done, and who was with him when he was being crucified. You know, sometimes we look at ourselves, right? And we're like, man, what's wrong with people? But then we look at Jesus and we're like, man, he only had a few people with him at the cross. And one of them was his mother. John 1, starting in verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Amen. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. See, darkness is just the absence of light. As soon as you turn on the light switch, darkness has to flee. It has no, it has no power. Okay? You know, Jesus, the Lord puts up our, the moon and the sun and all this beautiful light, natural light. But what happens? Even though it's dark outside, it's, we can still see. We can still see because it's lighting. Light will just light up the world. That's who Jesus is. He said that we are the light of the world. He is the light. So wherever He is, darkness has to flee. Darkness has to disappear. Darkness is not welcome. So you tell me when you turn on the light, unless the bulb is out, that it stays dark, because it doesn't. When we come in here, it's dark in here, as soon as you hit that switch, boom, darkness has to disappear. And that's the awesome thing about our God, is that wherever He is, darkness has to flee. Those thoughts, the, the thoughts of fear, the thoughts of man, like, when is, when is this going to end? When is, am I going to get over this storm? When am I going to have some peace already? When am I going to... You know what? We have to just start praying through it and believing God through it. Because God can bring you peace through the storm. Jesus had peace when He was on the boat. All the disciples were all freaking out and Jesus was asleep. And what did Jesus do? They woke him up and he got up and he says, okay. I can just imagine what he's thinking. Be still already because they're getting all freaked out. That's probably what he was thinking. It's not what he said, but that's probably what he was thinking. See, if the winds obey him, if the waters obey him, then who are we to disobey him? Isn't that a thought to ponder? I mean, the flowers don't bloom out of accident. They bloom because they're praising their creator. The rocks ain't beautiful out of accident as they're praising their creator. The birds ain't chirping just to chirp, just to annoy us. Right? They're doing it to praise their creator. Everything that has ever been created praises Him. Everything. And we just nothing but complainers. We complain a lot, don't we? We complain a lot. 
I mean, last night me and my wife were talking and we're like, man, we got to stop complaining and start going to the throne of God. Because he's the only one that can change our circumstance. The only one. There's nothing we can do on ourselves to change anything. Only God can change it. Only God can change the circumstance that we find ourselves in for all of us. See, the same God who created the universe is able to create new life within us. The light of life that exposes and drives away the darkness of the human race is the same light that brightens the dark corners of our world. See, this true light to the world and source of all life is also the source of our spiritual renewal. See, God's eternal word is infallible. How many of you can agree? Yeah. Everlasting, which simply means is about no error. There's no error in God's word. His word is truth. I mean, you can take that to the bank. Every single word and every single promise is in there is for us. Sure. Haven't you ever seen like, like, I know we have in the past, but like there's so many people like that say, well, I'm a New Testament believer. I'm an Old Testament believer. And it's like, really? Like, why well, is the same God, right? From Genesis to Revelation. Then why don't we believe? But then again, these are the same people that are quoting Old Testament scriptures that are pleasing to them. Like, for, for God knows the plans He has for you, to prosper you, and all these things, right? In Jeremiah 29, 11, all these promises, those are good, but when it comes to God's correction, yeah, I'm New Testament. I'm New Testament. Mm -hmm. Haven't we ever, like, spoke with, with other believers that have that belief system? And I think it's important to preach the Bible. Period. Not to pick and choose what we want to take God. It's like getting pages out of the Bible and just ripping them off. And they say, oh, that's not for today. That's not for today. That's not for today. He's not talking to me. That's not for today. Then we're all going to only probably stay with one page. Hmm. See, we, we have to obey his word, his eternal word. If the Bible says it, if his word declares it, then we have to obey it. He doesn't leave an option for us. He doesn't say, well, you know what? If you're a New Testament believer, just follow Jesus. Just follow my son and, and everything will be all right. You know the commands. Jesus even said, two more I'm going to add. Okay? So he added the last two commandments, but you're keeping those, you're keeping all of them, all ten of them. But back in the day, they, man, there was over the, they had made over 2,000. The Mosaic Law was over 2,000 commands. And what did, what did the Lord do? He just said, these are the ten most important ones. Follow these, and you'll be good. Follow these, and you'll be blessed. And you tell me that there's no power in the commandments of God. Because why are they taking our commandments out of government buildings? Because there is power in the word of God. There is power in his truth. People are being set free by his power. People are being set free by his word. Where, where are our morals for our laws? Where do our government get the morals for our laws? It's through the word of God. But people just don't want to give God the credit. Because they're lost. Isn't that sad? I think it was in, I can't remember what state it was, but there was a Ten Commandments in front of the courthouse that they had removed. The satanic people came. Have you heard about it? They came. And they put a statue of Satan in front of the Capitol because it was their right. And they're able to because they, that's, 
But when it comes to the Lord, something that, that's right, I mean, being a believer in Christ is, causes you to have good morals, to do good to your brother, to, good, to, good, to do good to your neighbor. We're not out sacrificing babies. We're not out killing dogs and drinking their blood. And that's what these things, I mean, look up Halloween. Look up what it stands for. Look up what takes place during this time. And people say, man, Pastor, you're so legalistic. You're just so out of it right now. No, you can believe whatever you want to believe. But if we're followers of Christ, then we have to stop participating in the things of this world. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's going to bars and going to clubs and, and stuff like that. People email me. People send me messages and they try to, but you know what, I don't, I don't, the word of God is the word of God, period. You know what I'm saying? And we have to stand up for the truth of God. We have to stand up for the truth of God, regardless if you agree with it or you don't agree with it. I mean, you can find a place of fellowship where they'll agree with your lifestyle, they'll agree with I mean, we accept everyone into our house of worship. We accept everyone and we'll love everybody. But I'm not going to change the word of God. I'm not going to change the way the Holy Spirit delivers the message to make you all feel better or to make myself feel better. We have to come to that understanding. I told my wife, I said, you know what? Let's start having picnics on Wednesday nights. Maybe potlucks or maybe something like this. Maybe and then, you know, people will start showing up. You know what I'm saying? See, it's sad to say, but we always have an agenda. We have an agenda. We always want something. You know what I'm saying? We always need something. Our discipleship is amazing. But it's the word of God that has drawn these men. I mean, I don't have donuts for them and coffee and... And I mean, there'll be a time for that, but you know what? It's beautiful when we can come together because it's the Word of God that has brought us together. Mm. See, God's eternal Word is unfollowable and everlasting, which simply means that there's no error. Our God of truth would not give us a book of mistakes to be our guide. We have to understand that. In 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, the word of the Lord says, All scripture. Okay, so if it's all scripture, what do you call the sentences in the Old Testament? You call them scriptures too, right? Okay. So it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, the Holy Bible is the ultimate guide along with the Holy Spirit to help us realize what is wrong in our lives. It is the only accurate measuring stick available to help us evaluate our lives. It reveals God's will for us and shows us how to relate properly, unselfishly to God and other people. God's Word offers more than just good advice. It promises God's powerful help to all who turn to Him with humble hearts. Spiritual growth can only occur when we take the time to understand and seek to obey what it says. So we have to obey what the Word of God says. God gives us enough light to follow the path He has for us. He's not going to show us the entire way from the beginning, just one step at a time as we need it. Let me tell you why He's not going to show you everything. Because when He shows us everything, guess what? We're not going to move another step. You know, when the Lord called my wife out in faith, to the ministry, if you would have showed me everything, 
I would have stayed put. I'm like, I don't think you're talking to me, Lord. Maybe it's a guy next to me. I just kind of overheard. There's a reason for that. See? Because that's where faith comes in. We're stepping out in faith. We're saying, Lord, I believe that you have a plan for my life and that this is the plan that you have me on. And during the past six years that we've been in full-time ministry, it's been, it's been a rough road. I mean, it's been amazing. I'm not going to lie. It's been an amazing, amazing, amazing. Me and my wife, we have, we have had so much fun. So much people have given their life to Jesus. Amen. But it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. It's been, there's been times where we're thinking like, what now? What are we going to do now? Maybe this is it. Maybe it's time. Maybe he's leading us somewhere else. Maybe, you know, all these thoughts of the enemy. Right? But we can't buy into that. But if we continue to listen to it, listen to it, listen to it, listen to it, then we start to believe it. That's where the word of God comes in. We have to listen to the word of God. When is enough going to be enough? When, when, is, when are we going to get to the point where we say, you know what, I've had enough already. It's time to start following Christ full force. It's time to start getting in my word. It's, start, it's time to start praying. It's, start to, it's, it's time to start to seek the Lord. I'm going to close with this. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Does it say lean on your own understanding and then I will... And, and, and then I will direct your path. No, it says, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. Acknowledge Him in everything we do. In everything that we do. Is it pleasing to God? Is our life pleasing to God? The things that we are putting ourselves to do, is it pleasing to God? We're like, yeah, Pastor, but you know, I mean, I go to clubs on the weekends and stuff, but I don't drink or nothing, you know. But look at the environment that we're in. I'm going there to, to witness. Yeah. How many people have God say since you've been going to the club? Well, you know, but they're drinking and, and stuff. Yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're putting ourselves in the fire, and when we end up getting burnt, we end up telling ourselves, man, I didn't know. But now you know. Don't put yourself in the fire and not expect to get burned. I mean, we, we are, of, we're not of this world. We live in this world, but we're not of it. We don't partake in those things anymore. How can we be the light to the world if we start bringing the world into the church? How can we reach people if there's no difference? There has to be a separation. There has to be a, a transformation. Yeah, but you have to get with the 20th century. But you know what? My God hasn't changed. And He says that He will never change. Shouldn't we follow that? Mm -hmm. Right? Isn't, isn't, when is Jesus going to be enough? When is Jesus going to be enough? Huh? When is Jesus going to be enough? We were enough for Him to get crucified. That's the love that He has for us. And He still has for us. Even for those that reject Him. But just because He loves Him doesn't mean that He's going to 
that they're going to get saved unless they turn their hearts to Him. You know, you have people say, man, what? Jesus loves everyone. Of course He loves everyone. He created them. But not all have the opportunity to become His children unless we're born again. So what a promise. God will direct us and crown our efforts with success if we put our trust in Him rather than try to do it on our own. Putting God first means turning our lives and our wills over to Him. Surrendering to His Lordship is humbling, but He will bless us as a result. He will bless us as a result. Think of this. We're here right now. We have the opportunity. We don't have to dig a tunnel underground to have church. Like in some countries. We're blessed. We're blessed. We can read the Bible anywhere we are. But what happens when they take that away from us? Do you have enough word in you to sustain you? Do we have enough word in us to sustain us? When they knock at our door and says, hey, those are coming with me. What do we do then? Yeah. Just leaving you with that thought to ponder on. But you know, the God that we serve is, is an amazing God. He's a God of not only a second chance, but another chance, another opportunity. As long as we're breathing air, there's time for repentance. Amen. As long as we're breathing, there is time for repentance. Amen. God is so gracious to us, so amazing, that He wants to have that personal relationship with us. And I'm 